I started out, my father was American military. My dad's commander came to me and he said, we want you to be part of this group. And you are going to take women away from practicing Islam, basically being free and feminist and living their lives. But in order to do that, I had to read Quran. I had to read Hadith. And I fell in love with the Quran. In the evenings, I was sitting with a group of Christians and, well, actually it was mostly Jews that would teach me Quran and Hadith and how to play with it. I decided if I had been a Jew when Isa salam came, I would have had to accept Isa salam. So how can I now deny Muhammad, even if it means giving up my life? When I took the Shahada, I felt something I never felt before. I was saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I literally went, <gasps> the first time in my life, I had breathed in. I called my father, who at that time was in Germany, and I was like, I became a Muslim. He told me, that's it, I'm sending a ticket. Tomorrow you'll be on a plane on your way to Germany. I said, I can't deny it. And he said, if you don't take this ticket, I no longer have a daughter, you're dead to me. He bought me a Ferrari. He's like, it's yours if you take off your hijab. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Sharifa Carlo and Alicia. Welcome to our interview. Thanks for accepting our invitation. I want to start with who is Sharifa Carlo and Alicia? Can you tell us briefly about your life? Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I started out, my father was American military, so I was born in Germany. And from Germany, I traveled around the world with my father. Essentially, I went to 13 schools in 12 years. I think that my growing up the way that I did left me open to new ideas, left me new, open to new cultures. Um, after that, I went to the university, and it was before I went to the university that the path to Islam began. I started international relations, then I quit that because I became a Muslim. I became Muslim at the age of 21. Then I did a degree in English. I did a, another bachelor's in science. I did a master's in composition and rhetoric. And my PhD is artificial intelligence, linguistic aspects. Also, I did an ijaza in Islamic studies so that I could teach Islam. And that's basically between working at the university, doing dawah, that's pretty much my life. How was your life in regards to faith? What were you believing in? I was raised as a Catholic. My father is a Southern Baptist, my mother was a Catholic, so in order for them to get married, he had to agree to raise us as Catholics, so that's what I grew up as. During the years, I looked at other different types of Christianity, but for the most part, I was a Christian. I believed that Jesus was God and the Son of God, and that if we didn't accept him and we didn't worship him, then we would go to hell. So that was my basic belief. We were quite religious, and my family was very conservative. The idea of God always resonated with me. At some point, I started to ask myself questions, and I even went to a Christian priest, um, a Catholic priest, and I asked him about the concept of the Trinity because it was very strange and it was hard to intellectualize. I'm a very logical, intellectual type person. So the way that he explained it was like nonsense to me. I had a hard time understanding it and accepting it, but... I really believed in God and everything around me, everybody around me was saying Jesus is God, the Son of God. Who was I to be questioning it? How did you decide to take a dangerous path of studying religious sciences in order to denigrate Islam? Okay, well, I didn't think of it as dangerous when I was doing it. And in high school, my dad's commander came to me and he said, look, we know your family, we know your position, we know that you are really good at debating and talking to people and convincing people, and your grades are good, and you're a good Christian. So we want you to be part of this group, and you are going to take women away from practicing Islam to basically being free and feminist and living their lives. So my mentality was these poor women. I really, really had no clue what Islam was. I hadn't, I'd never really studied it or learned about it. In school we have uh, the classes. In our book in high school it said that Muhammad was an epileptic and he would have epileptic fits. Um, he would get drunk and I mean it was just horrible stories that were not true. So I really didn't know anything about Islam. So I thought Muslim women are backwards, they don't know the real life, and that's what motivated me. I wanted to fix them, I wanted to save them. They knew that taking people away from Islam is very difficult, but to make them weak Muslims was easy. I remember once I was having a conversation 
um, with the daughter of another, of a general. And we, it was in the 1970s when the Iranians took over the American embassy and they were holding them captive. And I was like, why don't our fathers just go over there and destroy all of them? And she said, I was just asking my father that last night. And what he said was that with most people, it is the fear of death, the fear of annihilation that keeps them in control and America is able to control them that way. But when people practice Islam, they don't fear death so you can't control them. I remembered that later when I became a Muslim, I was like, oh, now I get it. <laughs> what types of dangerous situations did you encounter during your participation in this organization and how did you deal with them? As I said, I never dealt with any danger. Um, I never even finished with them. I was in my third year of the university and while I was in the university, I was learning about Islam in the evenings during the day, I had my normal classes in international relations. In the evenings, I was sitting with a group of Christians and, well, actually it was mostly Jews that would teach me Quran and Hadith and how to play with it. You know, in the Quran, it says to take your veil and to put it over your bosom. Well, it doesn't say over your head, it says over your bosom. So if you wear a shawl, you're doing what the Quran says. So somebody who doesn't have a lot of knowledge of Islam and doesn't know that the women were already covering their head and it was just fixing the hijab, not that they didn't have to cover their head, it'd be easy to misguide them. So they were teaching me to do these types of things. But in order to do that, I had to read Quran. I had to read Hadith. And I fell in love with the Quran. I never made it out of the university even because in my third year, I became a Muslim. I know the man who recruited me and I knew the professors that I was working with, nobody else. All I know is they were paying for everything and they had already set up my job in the American embassy for when I graduated with the international law. So maybe like seven years down the line. What's the organization's biggest goal in teaching their members the Qur'an and Hadith to the point where they can manipulate the Qur'an and Hadith and change the minds of the Islamic community? What they wanted was the power and the control. They also recognized that, because I did question, why are we targeting feminism and women? And their answer is, if you destroy a man, you destroy a man. If you destroy a woman, you destroy the generations that come after her. So they become less practicing of Islam. They become weaker and more focused on the dunya and not on the akhira. These people can be easily manipulated and moved and done whatever they want to do with them. They don't care if these people go to Jannah or Jahannam. What they care about is we can control them, we can manipulate them, we can make this society do what we want them to do. You know, there's an old saying that the most, the strongest way to control people is sex, drugs, and music. And by music, it means like all of media. So utilizing these things, you keep people doing what you want to do or focused on life. So the ones in power can do whatever they want to do. And you don't notice it and you don't care because you're focused on, I need this car. I need to be beautiful. I need to, you know, like now I need the likes. I need whatever it is that I need that is dunya oriented. So what changed in you? Can you tell us about the first changes in your heart, this warmth towards Islam? The first thing, as I'm reading, you're reading the Quran, it is so logical. The Quran makes sense. When you're sitting there and reading it and looking over the verses, you're understanding there's only one God. This God doesn't have a child. This God is omnipotent. This God is everything that you may need in a God. Everything that you would think is a God. It made sense. Nobody could answer the questions when I asked them about this Trinity. So it really appealed to my sense of logic. That is why when I was starting to learn it and it started to appeal to me, I decided to take classes in Christianity to make myself a stronger Christian. I'm taking the classes in Christianity. I go into the class. It's a Harvard graduate professor. He's like 80 something years old. He is very well known as a theological scholar for Christianity. And I said, okay, he's going to teach me the Old Testament, the New Testament from the original. We studied the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Latin. And the first thing he did in class, he picked up a copy of the Bible, the King James Version in English. And he said, take this and throw it in the trash. My heart froze. And then he said, Jesus didn't speak English. And then he took us back. Turned out that he was a Unitarian, meaning that he believed that there was only one God and that Jesus was a prophet. SubhanAllah. Still a Christian, but because of all the things he had studied, he had recognized that this had been a change in the Bible. So when he took us through the old documents, the changes, the additions, the deletions, and he gave us the historical uh, connotations like why did this happen, who did this, and why did they do it. So instead of getting a stronger faith, I completely lost faith in Christianity, and here I am still studying the Quran, still studying the words of the Prophet So that was year one.
Year two and three were spent studying every religion in the world because I was still in love with the idea that I'm going to be an ambassador. I'm going to be high class. I'm going to be in a certain level, which already I was at this level, but I was going to be on my own, not through my father. I wanted the dunya. I wanted this life. I wanted the money. I wanted the class. I wanted the position. I didn't want to lose all of this. And I knew that if I became a Muslim, that's exactly what's going to happen. So I studied every religion you can imagine. At the end, I realized there's no way around this. Islam is the truth. Well, Buddhism and um, Hinduism are more philosophies than religions to me. All of them have the same moral background, the same ethical background. The problem is I can't believe that there are millions of gods. I can't believe that a human can be a god. I mean, if I'm going to accept Buddha, then I'm going to accept Jesus. None of them made sense to me. I was looking for God. Who is God? What does he want from us? If I'm going to change from Christianity to something else, it has to be something that offers me more, not less. One of the things that I love to do is when I'm teaching someone Islam, I don't just say Allah says and the Prophet Sallallahu says. I'm very clear about that. Allah says this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said this. This is how the companions put it into effect. This is how all the scholars through the centuries understood it. And let's take a look at sociology. You see how that fits in. Let's take a look at psychology. You see how that fits in. Here we have physics. See how that fits in. So that we are able to, as Allah said, look at the evidences and reflect. So that way, not only does it make it clearer to other people, it strengthens it in my heart. Because again, I'm a very logical person. After studying other religions for many years, you tried very hard not to enter Islam. So what changed your mind and made you enter Islam in the end? I'd say within a week, because I can't remember that it's a long time ago, the exact amount of days, but within a week before I actually converted or reverted to Islam, I had this dream where I'm running and I'm terrified. There's something behind me and it's evil. I can't see it. All I can do is hear it. And I know that it's coming after me and I know that it's evil and it wants to destroy me. I woke up terrified. At that moment, I begged, I said, oh God, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, I don't care who you are. I need to know the truth. I need to know who you are. Before this time, I'm reading and studying to not want to be a Muslim because I loved the Quran, but I didn't want Islam. It would destroy everything. After the dream, I wanted to know the truth. So my intention completely changed. So when that happened, within a week, I get a phone call from a student at the university. How he found my number, only Allah knows. He's telling me, because I, I used to question people, you know, that I saw that were Muslim. He said to me, there's a group of people here they're traveling around the United States and I told them about you. They want to meet you. I agreed to go and meet with the people. Mashallah. The man, his name was Namatullah. He was, he had to be over 80. Big white beard, no black hair anywhere, only white hairs, but very intelligent. And I'm questioning him and he's telling me, no, in the Bible they changed this. No, this was actually added and so forth. The same things that my professor had said. And then it clicked. This is the truth. I can't deny it. I can't keep denying it. And now it makes sense. It's logical. And that's what convinced me. That point, I decided if I had been a Jew when Isa salam came, I would have had to accept Isa salam. So how can I now deny Muhammad, even if it means giving up my life? It wasn't easy. And I honestly believe that Allah strengthened me because I was a spoiled brat. I was somebody that, you know, might I would go to dad and say, I want, I want, I want, and here's the card, go get it. It wasn't an easy decision, but it was like, how can I deny this? It's the truth. So not everything in Islam, I can explain it, but Allah keeps showing me things to make me stronger. I honestly believe that Allah will give you what you need when you need it. So can you take us to the Shahada moments? How did you feel? At the end of the night, it was Fajr. Because the Sheikh, he said to me, we have to pray. I had been the whole night arguing with this poor old man. May Allah give him Janet of the house. He's like, we have to pray, but I invite you to become a Muslim. And these words were very strong to me because nobody had ever said, become a Muslim. Even though I'd thought about it, nobody had ever invited me to it. I never leave anybody without saying, I invite you to become a Muslim. When he said these words to me, my heart was like, this is what I want, this is what I need. So Alhamdulillah, I told him yes. When I took the Shahada, I felt something I never felt before. I was saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, and I felt like there was something heavy on my chest that had been ripped off. I literally went, <gasps> and it was as if for the first time in my life, I had breathed in. 
years later, I'm reading in the Quran, the verse that talks about going, the people that are not Muslims or don't believe, their chests are constricted like the one going up in the mountain. I was, I, the whole day was just exhilarating. I felt like I was free. I felt like finally I found the place that I needed to be. I found who and what I needed to be. And I felt like, uh, like a spiritual high. Even <laughs> I went home to my apartment I called my father, who at that time was in Germany, and I was like, I became a Muslim. And his words, are you crazy? Have you been brainwashed? What's wrong with you? He wasn't happy, of course. And he told me, that's it. I'm sending a ticket. Tomorrow you'll be on a plane on your way to Germany. And I told him I can't. I said, I can't deny it. This is the truth. I cannot deny it. He told me he's sending me a ticket, which he did. It was delivered to the house the next day. And he said, if you don't take this ticket, I no longer have a daughter, you're dead to me. And wallahi, it's only from Allah that I was able to, to survive that because I was very close to my family. But again, it was only from Allah. Only from Allah because I'm not strong. I know that I'm not a strong person. But Allah gives you what you need. My family is basically, daddy says, everybody follows. I was left alone. I was thrown out of the university. I was basically left, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Like I told you, I was a spoiled brat. So I had a brand new cherry red Camaro. I sold it. And I lived from that for the next year because I didn't have a job. I didn't finish my education. My father had disowned me. My brothers, my sisters, my aunt, nobody would communicate with me. On top of this, subhanAllah, I don't know who. There were days I would come down. I never told anybody I had problems. I never told anybody that my family had disowned me. But I would come down because I lived upstairs to my mailbox and I would find envelopes of money inside. I don't know where it came from. I'm going to assume the Muslim community thought this woman needs somebody to help her. But to this day, I don't know who left the, that money, but alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, they helped a lot. Why were you expelled from the university? I put on hijab the day I became Muslim. As soon as my professor saw me, he's like, what are you doing? I explained that I had become a Muslim and he's like, you recognize you've lost everything. So they threw me out of the university. Basically, these people run the university. They're basically, you know, the organization, the people that are within it, they basically are the dean and the president and these type things. The dean of my college said, take the class, continue your class. I guarantee you an F from now. And I didn't know what to do. And I knew that he could do that. Um, the final classes that I had were all independent studies. It was just the, the last part of my education. And if I don't get this, I won't get an education. So for one year, I didn't go to school. I had a hard time getting a job. I even tried to get a job as a, as a file clerk, you know, just filing papers. And they told me, I'm sorry, your, your hijabi thing won't let you, because of that, you won't be able to do filing. As if somehow this made me stupid. Daddy knows that I love fast cars. He bought me a Ferrari. He's like, it's yours if you take off your hijab. <laughs> but I had to say, I'm sorry. Dunya or Allah, which do I want? And it was, you know, very simple to choose, alhamdulillah. I was able to pay my rent. I was able to pay basic things that I needed. But by the end of the year, essentially, which is why to this day, I don't really like pasta very much with red sauce. Only thing that I could afford to buy was tomato paste, a few spices and macaroni because I was broke, completely broke. But then Allah opened the door, subhanAllah. My father by that time was in Puerto Rico. He was the base commander in Puerto Rico. He called me and he said, there's been a threat on the lives of all of us that work on the military and federal buildings here. All of these positions, them and their families have been threatened by a group of people who wanted Puerto Rico to be independent. So my father called me and he's like, you'll have security at your house within an hour. And he sent a Marine to my house to guard. After that, I was there for like a couple of days. And then he flew me to where he was in our home in South Carolina. And he took me back at that moment. I can't blame my father. If you love someone, he loved me, I'm his daughter. You want to save them from what you think is a mistake. So he figured this spoiled brat, if I take away the money, if I take away the family, if I take away all the things that she loves, she'll come running back. And I didn't. And he might have made it longer, giving me a chance to come back, but now I'm in danger. So he said, forget all that, let me just get her back. And that's what he did. So from that moment, alhamdulillah, he took care of everything. What were you thinking in this whole year? What was going through your mind? How were you feeling? And how, how could you, you know, deal with this difficult situation? I know it sounds weird, 
I had read the hadiths that if Allah loves somebody, he tests them. He doesn't want you to have in your heart other than him, not the dunya, not your family, not your society. So I felt that, okay, Allah is testing me. Allah wants to see if I really believe. Allah wants to see if I'm going to be good. And if I do it, he's going to love me. And that's the thing that motivated me. I wanted Allah to love me. What was the reaction of the organization when you converted to Islam? Did they try to harm you so that you would not spread their secret? How did it go for you? I never even told anybody how I became Muslim until maybe 10, 12 years after I became Muslim, somebody asked me the question and they were shocked by my answer. And from that moment, they were like, you need to write this. You need to put this on the internet. And I did. I wrote it and that's when people started to show me, oh, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is amazing. We didn't know that this existed. We've heard of such things, but we didn't know that it's real. But before that, I never even told anybody how I had become Muslim. I want to thank you for inviting me here and Eternal Passenger has been actually very kind to me and your questions have been very intellectually stimulating. I'm very happy that I'm able to come and do this for y'all.